Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's Scripps College Humanities Institute event. Um, this year's theme is, as you saw on the first slide, a broader history of thought. Uh, where we're presenting a variety of foundational thoughts outside of European influence on their own terms. The format today will be the usual uh, after the presentation. Uh, audience members can type, actually at any time, they can type questions into the Q&A function, and I will ask them on your behalf during the discussion if there's time. Panelists can ask questions on their own simply by unmuting and asking during the discussion. It's my great honor now to introduce our speaker for today. Professor Nkiro Nzegwu is SUNY Distinguished Professor in the Department of Africana Studies and in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies uh, at the State University of New York at Binghamton. She's also Professor Extraordinari Extraordinarius at the School of Transdisciplinary Research and Graduate Studies at the University of South Africa. She is uh, the founder of Africa Knowledge Project and Africa Resource Center Incorporated. She is author of Family Matters, Feminist Concepts in African Philosophy of Culture uh, and co-editor of The New African Diaspora and editor of Unicha at the Millennium, Legacy, History and Transformation and His Majesty Nameka Alfred Ugochukwo Achibe in a, a, a 10 year milestone. She has published extensively on African aesthetics, art, feminism, and philosophy. Professor Nzegu is not only a philosopher though, uh, also a painter, author, and curator. She's received a senior humanities fellowship at UCLA, senior research grant at the Getty, fellowship from the Society for the Humanities at Cornell University, and has also held a Smithsonian Institution postdoctoral fellowship. Please uh, help me welcome Professor Nkiro Nzegu. Thank you, Yuval, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you to the um, Institute, the Humanities Institute for um, inviting me for this, um, um, for this lecture. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking for the first slide, just for everybody to see the title and uh, to follow that with uh, the next title. But first of all, Oku Extenders, uh, Women's Sacrality and Transformative Art. So let's get to the second um, slide. And the importance of the slide is to give a, a context and the meaning to the, uh, techno to the uh, terminology Oku. Oku means light, fire, or fired up in Igbo language. Oku also connotes heat and energy. So when I use Oku extenders, I mean fire extenders. Its connotation is light, heat, or energy extenders. And in my mind, when I talk of energy extenders, they are energy channelers. So I'd like to begin by, with a declarative statement, there is no gender in ordinary. This statement serves notice that a decolonial critical African studies methodology is being deployed. Unlike most colonial theorizing or most decolonial theorizing, the following analysis is unencumbered by imperialism, a complicated and difficult preservation of imperialist ideas and processes, even as an Analysis present the epistemological outcome as decolonial and anti-imperialist. Many um, articles will talk about being decolonial, but inherent in them remains the idea and the parameters of decolonial of colonial thinking. So enough damage has been done by epistemologists propping up hegemonic idealizations that protect the theoretical relevance of gender animating the doctrine of feminism. Ordinary conceptualized as first principles proclaim that physical materiality and ashe, the non-material life force are inextricably intertwined. 
It also speaks directly about Annie or Earth Mother and his first laws of life. Decolonial philosophizing takes us to Odinani, to the regulating force, Chi Uhu, the supreme spiritual consciousness, and to conceptions of reality and humanity where Eziofu Bundu, truth is life, and Eziofu Bundu, falsehood is death. So in this framework, the moral imperative of knowledge and of theorizing impresses us to speak the truth and to avoid falsehood. There in that realm of deep mysteries, one tries to avoid either ikekeluhu or more meaning falling into the abysmal bottomless pit that forever separates one's chi from the universal anchor. Within this chi permeated reality, humanness, that is human attributes, regulate human values and agency defines humanity. Human beings like every other entity in the universe exist temporarily as individualized chi. Women are adult and as adult females in their creative, productive and reproductive roles as artists and mothers in various communities are oku extenders. They transform life from one form to another, thereby extending oku, the energy of chi on life. So writings on African art produced from the Western standpoint misconstrue the essence of art produced in a universe conceptualized as a living, sentient being. The major defect of those writings is not only are they exogenous epistemologies of alterity, they are also vitiated by imperialism's concept of gender that evacuates African ontologies and social logics and replaces them with Western ontology. This substitution of African teleologies for a Eurocentric one fundamentally changes social reality. Africa's existential experiences and morality codes. Most significantly, it moves people from thinking human and seeing art as sacral activity to quote, thinking gender differentiation and seeing art as reductively matter and desire directed. So in this lecture, I argue that the concept of gender at the core of imperialism is complicit in perpetuating African women's subjugation and diminishing their capacities and achievements. The argument is constructed, is conducted in three broad moves. First, we examine and bypass this dystopian concept of gender that never transcends its defining analytic, notably, the pivotal idea that sex differences entail sexism or social relations of male power and dominance. Secondly, we examine the world of humanness that emerges after banishing that dystopian reality of imperialism and sexism in which the agency and creative potentialities of women emerge in fullness. Lastly, we reconsider or we consider how life in this conceptually different world expands our pathways to knowledge and creativity. Now, the first part where I look at the concept of gender as a dystopian concept is one that I will not focus on only because most of the ideas and the arguments are woven into the other sections. So I will not look at it on its own but it's imperative to begin to look at how in understanding women's creativity, we begin to see not just the shortfall of gender, but we have to relocate art, aesthetic thinking outside of a framework that does not see 
the earth and uh, the, the earth and the universe as a living sentient being. So how do we create uh, within that context? But I'll begin with the general thesis that explains a world without gender and what is going to happen in that world. From the moment of European colonization, the presentation of African art to the world sh shifted it from its aesthetic base. The Western framework of knowledge ensured that Africa's art was neither understood from its philosophical roots nor seen from the perspective of Africans. In the first phase of theorizing up until the 1970s, white males were the primary proponents of the art, followed decades later in the second phase by white women. A unifying thread runs through the works of the two groups of scholars that as products of Euro modernity ideology, we are shared by racial and sexual idealizations. From this epistemological base, the Western aesthetic lens instinctively privileged male bodies, male lens, male focus, and male activities. This male privileging character of Euro modernity research is further magnified by reliance on male informants who, as a respected Euro modernist anthropologist, Robert S. Rattray later disclosed, revealed only male views and biases, having learned that the white man was interested only in men. Collectively, all this explained why Western researchers hewed to their own artistic scheme that treated ceramics and pottery as lesser art forms and subsequently ignored them in Africa. Could I go to slide two? Second slide, please. Yet, what we making move to slide um, three, two, next slide, please. Um, the next slide, this slide actually emphasizes the precepts of the Igbo ethical system and the principles that guides the ways in which knowledge, wisdom, and the production of knowledge uh, operates. Oma is primordial first mother, madam, human beings, and one siblings of the same mother. These will be explained when I get into the um, body of the work. Could we see the next slide, please? Thank you. What we're making in West Africa, for instance, is the oldest, most versatile, and most important art form, going back to before 10,000 BC. The 10,000 BC cutoff date merely references the time frame of recent archaeological discoveries, not the date of commencement of pottery making in the region, which is to say that pottery making possibly was longer in the region, but the shards that have been discovered and have been analyzed merely goes back to uh, 10,000 BC. And given that the archeological work in Africa is still quite um, not up to par, what happens is that less work uh, or less shards, less archeological discoveries have been made. The influence of the artistic and aesthetic Euro modernity tra traditions explains why Michael Cardew described pottery as an inferior art as quote, the lowest in the hierarchy of native hand handicrafts, end quote. The reason for this <coughs> he offers is not that the raw materials, his, it's not that quote, the raw materials cost little, the tools and equipment almost nothing, 
end quote, but because, quote, it is very largely a woman's trade, end quote. The Englishman, Michael Cardew, justifies his inference on women's inferior inferiority by leaning on Rattray, whom he claims, quote, was informed in Ashanti that it is not worth the while of men to make them, end quote. It is not, it is not worthy that Cardio's appeal to a white male authority is an imperialist move propped up by the colonialist idea that rationality inheres only in white male bodies. The deployment of Rattray to buttress the claim that, quote, for the natives, end quote, pottery is an inferior art, reeks of Western masculinist prejudice towards both women and pottery. Cardi was oblivious of how West, his Western, his appeal to his Western intellectual scheme, goes back to his Western intellectual scheme. The Ashanti informants merely reproduced what the white man wanted to hear. In light of my earlier argument, it makes sense to ask, why do Africans really think this way? Why would the Ashanti think in this disparaging way of their women and of their artistic creations? Cardio failed to address the possibility that the artistic biases and prejudices he attributed to the Ashanti may indeed have come from his Euro modernist framework. His summation that, quote, it is very likely a woman's trade, end quote, is his own and his Western compeers' views, not the Africans. It is these kinds of sleight of hand that transpose Western prejudices onto Africa. It is the same uncritical male privileging assumptions that propelled Congolese male potter, Vuania Mbua, to the status of master potter in the eyes of the West. Yet, as researcher Den De uh, Denka Volavka disclosed, Mbua was not celebrated locally as a potter, and his pots were made exclusively for European white consumption, end quote. Interestingly, the Euro modernity standpoint can celebrate a potter as an artist only if he is male. Its ability to reverse its claim in favor of male creators raises pressing questions on the one hand about how African art is inaccurately portrayed by Western scholars and on the other hand, about how Africans really see pottery and art. What actually do we learn that is different when seeing through African eyes? So um, first and foremost, and here I'm going to shift to the paradigm of the um, ordinary ontology. So when we, begin to work and operate within the ordinary ontology, what actually transpires both epistemologically and uh, in terms of how we understand a reality. First and foremost, critical narrators root their art in their cultural base. Re relocation to the pre-1884 world of Africa through underscoring complementarity and one humanness moves us into a world without gender in which the category as a social organizing category did not exist. In ordinary, the relations between women and men were multiple, shifting and marked by multiple centers of power that were not gender defined. This is to say, that women collectively were not under male dominion, nor were they inferiors. Social, political, and economic power did not coalesce along the lines stipulated by gender, nor were they in the hands of men. 
Females possessed wide ranging social and political powers as do men. The social logic and ontology did not privilege only men and poetry and art and poetry had a different role and thus were seen differently. Secondly, because human power is a human trait, it is exercised by females as well as by males. Within ordinary ontology, poetry, so, po pottery, sorry, po pottery possessed cosmological and philosophical significance and an important role in African societies. Because this phenomena is totally obscured by the values of Euro modernity and a scholarly tradition, Western researchers misread African societies and their philosophies of art. Even when white American anthropologist Anita Glaze was confronted with the quote, magnificent role women play in ostensibly male artistic spheres, end quote, by which she means a non-gender space among the Senufo of Northern Ivory Coast, Eastern Mali and Western Burkina Faso, Lisa Aronson noted that Glaze failed to fully comprehend it. But most interestingly, African-American art historian, Sylvia Aiden Boone was able to do so amongst the Mende of Sierra Leone because she interrogated her conceptual framework and came to see things differently. Basically what I'm arguing here is that the complexities that may seem to uh, exist oftentimes may be presented as something the West cannot apprehend or grasp. And so when Anita Glaze encountered a scenario where the Senufo women were producing works that she imagined was in a male artistic spheres, in the local setting, the sphere was not distinguished or dichotomized as male or female, but even from the West, an art historian who happens to be an African-American was able to appreciate and apprehend the fact that these type of distinctions were not apt. And she was able to do so because she critiqued or she subjected to her analysis um, the Western framework she was utilizing and within which she had been raised. So in a sense, she was able to defer and put aside her Western framework while she strived to understand the African art and the women's creativities on their own terms. Now, but what does, so Sylvia Boone was able to effectively interrogate her conceptual framework and see things differently. Boone's strategy reveals that the root cause of other Western scholars failings has to do with their reluctance to shift their own conceptual scheme. And one can wonder why it's inexplicable that some are able to do it and others are not able to do it. But the questions go to the validity of the assumptions that is oftentimes ascribed to the Western framework. The reluctance to shift the framework is oftentimes tied to the fact that the Western framework of analysis is the preeminent scholarly or epistemic framework that needs to be utilized, whereby that of any other societies does not measure up. So in a sense, other societies framework of creation is seen as, is seen as something that can be sub, subsumed under that of the uh, Western lens. So to begin to grapple what the significance of women in art creating 
is in the African context and the power that African women have in the societies and which they bring to art and to art theorization, we have to shift perspectives. So to give an answer to these multiple um, complicated uh, issues, we resort to the, an African-centered reading that forces a foundational shift of the Western framework. Such a shift will return us to the African or Dinani philosophies, histories and social logics in the production of art and pottery. The ontological shift interestingly places women at the center of creativity and at the foundation of art. Women were never peripheral to art nor to creativity. In different regions of Africa and in different historical moments, potteries had a prominent space and status in societies. So unlike in the Western framework where pottery is seen as craft and marginalized, in the African framework, it is centered and the foundation of all the subsequent art forms that emerged. In different regions of Africa and in different historical moments, portraits had a prominent space and status in the societies. They were widely collected as the ninth century potter, as the ninth century pottery shards at the Iboku excavations reveal. And equally to the Emea of Abuja, magnificent collection of pottery, which Cardio positively acknowledged in 1972, establishes the value and importance in which even local leaders placed on pottery. More recently, Barbara Thompson. Thompson reported on the deference that Tate Habibu showed to the great potter Namsifueli Nyeiki, whose ceramic vessels he collected for his work as a healer. He spoke of his energy and power and that it was highly efficacious in his healing work. So just to summarize, once you shift to the African framework, the, the approach that people bring to bear on pottery and the fact that pottery is created by women um, has a different connotation. It's seen as a highly valued um, mode of creativity and mostly sought after in important ways. Pottery is the foundation of African art due to its being the oldest art there is in Africa. It predates the emergence and spread of iron technology. Recent archaeological excavations established that poetry production in West Africa goes back to over 10,000 BC. Archaeological data in Igbo land establishes that ceramics was one of the oldest art industries. In fact, it predates the development of iron working and manufacture of bronzes. The symbolic and stylistic grammar of fine pottery produces a decorative aesthetics consisting of applique, concentric circle, spirals, and geometric patterns. Next slide. That proliferate widely in the region. Some of the slides display unique sculptural elements enhanced with lines and geometric forms. In 1989, Anselm Ibeano established that the ninth century decorative motifs and pottery styles found on Ibofu pottery, which can be described as Ibofu styles, had been dated to 760 AD in Afibu and identified in undated potteries in other locales such as Ini, Ishiago, Orobu, and Ehandiago. Okay, um, now, the pervasiveness of the patterns, their longevity, 
and continuation to the present day and their locally based meanings collectively establish that the aesthetics and stylistics developed locally. Ogundirong makes a convincing case that the archeological finds of Ibohu and environs and Onwejiogo's history of Unri hegemony strongly undermine the ahistorical narratives of Simon Ertenberg on the Igbo and Igbo arts. Both scholars portray Ndi Igbo as far more culturally sophisticated and technologically advanced than Shaw and Ertenberg envisaged. In addition to archeological investigations, various regional ethnographies, trade patterns, and local community histories established that the main potters in Igbo land were women. The prevalence of women in this foundational art form and at the center of artistic creativity says a lot about African women as artistic and technological pioneers, a fact that is hardly ever acknowledged in Euro modernity scholarship on Africa. And such scholarship is always looking to men for explanation and answers about life, philosophy, and social dynamics. The intelligence, knowledge, and humanity of women were consistently ignored and routinely erased. The foundation of art and the center of creative activity in most of, in most of Africa was on clay and pottery production. Women were the center of this artistic production. Though women were at the center, researchers are yet to fully see and acknowledge them for their artistic and scientific discoveries. Consider that the art of Igwiti or pottery production requires highly skilled, specialized skills that are rooted in knowledge and wisdom. It begins with a knowledge of soil types knowledge of different types and properties of clay, knowledge of soils for producing coloring slips, knowledge of the relevance of slips, and knowledge of the geological locations of clay and redstone for the slips. At the very least, women had to have studied nature intently and intensely to have discovered where the pliable Malleable clay were ge geologically located on Earth, on the Earth's surface, or where to quarry for those in the ground. And I should underscore that some of the uh, clay quarries do not appear on the surface, which raises the question again, how were they able to tell that a particular type of slay resided in the ground? The knowledge this transformation suggests is quite significant. It suggests indeed, indeed it tells us that the very first geologists, scientists and technological innovators in the region were women. They pioneered and invented the exact processes of earthenware production after having experimented and determined the necessary chemical processes and steps for transforming quarried clay soil into impermeable, usable earthenware products. This knowledge cannot be taken lightly as it did not exist before. And it was vital for producing earthenware vessels and containers that subse subsequently fulfilled human needs. So I want to move now to a section titled Ordinani as the first the maternal first force. And here I'm going to look at the relationship between Odinani, the maternity and the first force of creation. Odinani is a compaction of three words, Odi, it is, na, in or on, ani, earth, ground or land. Literally it states, it is in the ground, but the expressive meaning of the world is much more than that. Ordinary is not a simple empirical statement about the ground, ground, land, or earth. It is a deep, important conceptualization about land, 
earth or ground in the grand universal scheme. In Ibo cosmology, and it is the earth and simultaneously Alosi, a divine entity. And due to, to this, and due to its sacredness, it is also an altar. So anybody who stands on earth and utters a word, the person is standing on an, on an altar and making a powerful speech, though people never think about it that way. And it is the first force that possesses and models the attributes of a ne or mother. That is why it's maternalized. Maternal Ani, as I will see, is the link to Chuhu, the creator, which whose knowledge and whose wisdom she gave, she gave birth to. And it signifies the earth as sacred, as the first force and phenomenon of creation from which earth dwellers arose, lived and are welcomed back into earth in the cycle of life. At the same time, all newly born continue to live in a long chain of seemingly endless cycles. As a place of habitation and life, the sacred energy of the earth sustains and nourishes all that live on earth. Its force parallels human mothers who are cast in her image and who by virtue of the synchronicity of their tasks become her propitiators and communicators in their spiritual duties as intercessors, Annie reveals herself to them, imparting knowledge of their various forms, the different energy of her properties and soul types, plants, as well as the energy pathways in her. Within the ordinary uh, ontology, what I'm arguing here is that there's an intimate connection of the role of Ani and what Ani stands for and the role of uh, women as mothers. And because of this close interrelationship, women are her propitiators and by virtue of that become the voice for humanity through which she communicates. Necessity is always the mother of invention and the catalyst that leads to discoveries. The catalyst for harnessing and its properties, the catalyst for harnessing and its properties for fine pottery production was food, proportion, uh, food preparation and food preservation. Her intercessors had to learn the diverse and different ranges of her properties. The cognitive and belief systems associated with translating the knowledge learned into use in pottery production, boosted women's power and social dominance at every facet of life. Eating, drinking, cleaning, bathing, washing requires some form of vessel or container which women Potters invented and produced. Next slide. Pottery was the mainstay of life and in time became a major economic activity. All aspects of spiritual and everyday life was touched by pottery. Consider the ubiquity of Ite, the earthenware clay pot among the Igbos. Next slide. In the culinary department, there were itenni, general cooking pots, ububa, white clay trays for drying items, in your colander for draining items, itofe, black and small pots for cooking all kinds of soup. Next slide. Oko, lightly decorated bowls, utilized for serving or storing food, and mboma, 
elaborately decorated bowls used for serving distinguished guests. The latter were also found in shrines. For food fermentation, next slide, outside, outside white mouth ite pots were used and were situated outdoors close to the cooking areas of the Usohu Uke um, of the homestead. They were utilized for fermenting cassava, corn, sorghum, and millet. For drinking purposes, next slide, there were nukuite mili, large outside storage water pots that held water for general household uses. Due to their large sizes, sizes these were generally stationary and were filled after numerous trips to the stream. There were also Odo, next slide. There were also Odo, wide mouth, medium sized pots for drinking, for storing drinking water. These were generally kept in cool shady spots, either in the interior of the home or in verandas. The inside of these pots were treated with smoke before putting the pot to use to ensure that insects do not lay eggs in the water. Eco, special clay pots we are used for to retrieve drinking water from the Odo, as well as for drinking purposes. And Itogo were small pots used for medicinal preparations and storage. Itemanya were wine pots with the rope, body roped for carrying around and the base mounted on thick circular fiber pads. Ike, Iteike is the pot of valor and strength and Udu, a pot with multiple necks and rings ranging from one to seven were made exclusively for women of status and prestige. Next slide. For musical purposes, there were also another udu, a narrow necked musical resonator pot with a handle and spherical opening at the top. The opening is situated at the opposite end of the handle and the tegu pot xylophone with wide rims containing different water levels. Next slide are also played with a fan-like beater. In short, different types of earthenware container were fabricated for a whole range of uses that met people's needs. The knowledge of pottery production was passed from mother to daughter and interested female relatives. Sons typically were not instructed in the craft due to the rituals associated with pottery production, though some learn by observing. The social ontology of Odinani that made this a female activity was like that which placed men in charge of the knowledge, domestication, and cultivation of yams, a key crop in Igbo agriculture and diet. A team of plant geneticists led by Nora Skarskelly is recently corroborated what Ndibu had been stating all along that yams were first domesticated, not in the tropical savanna as had hither, hitherto been assumed, but in the Niger River basin from the forest species. According to, to the Inri, this knowledge came from Chuku Abiyama, the great god of knowledge and wisdom, just like the knowledge of pottery production did. Some may point out, some may point to this differentiation of spheres of activities as proof of the existence of gender in Igbo society. But as I have consistently argued, gender speaks explicitly to a society-wide institutionalization of male dominance and privileges that supervene the power of men over women. 
the supervenient relation is illegitimately and illicitly achieved by simultaneously flight, flattening all men's identities, inflating their social powers, and according privileges to all their roles, and then flattening women's identities and deflating their social worth. It is this hegemonic hierarchical power, this skewed relations of power that gives the category of gender its epistemic importance, even as it is underplayed, even as it's underplayed as a relevant factor. Consider that if there were no hierarchical differences between the sexes in the society, gender will hold no significance, value, or interest, since there will be nothing to say about the relationship between women and men. It behooves us to note that careful, intricate distribution of power between men and women in Igbo society, for instance, that creates an intricate complementarity matrix of powers. This is what obstructs the emergence of male dominance. The fact that there are males and females in all societies does not mean all societies are gendered. Because the social ontology of the West is hegemonically upheld for all societies, every society in history is compuls compulsorily read, analyzed, and evaluated as gender. But this is erroneous. In contrast to the Western gendered scheme, ordinarily ontology portioned out spheres of social control and activity to men and women on the principle of male-female comp complementarity rather than on principles of male dominance over women. Ordinary cosmos strategically weaves life in dynamic modes of complementarity, interweaving cosmology and epistemology at critical junctures of learning and knowledge acquisition to equitably distribute duties and tasks. In the ordinary conceptual scheme, art, aesthetics, cosmology, and epistemology combine to illuminate women's knowledge of poetry production. Annie, divinity and earth delivers empirical knowledge of the geological character and location of soils and the essential chemical processes and production of production. At the center of artistic insight and inspiration, however, is Ogugu, the female divinity of human fertility. Creativity was seen and treated as synonymous with fertility. The capacity to produce or birth new life and new forms. Art on this social logic is an art of human creation that speaks to human necessity and results in the transformation of one substance and another one substance and form into another of a different state and form. In a manner of speaking, equity to mold pots is likened to the metaphysical processes of Iwomadu to mold humans in the sense that both references creativity and artistic activity mirrors Chuhu Abiyama's production of human forms from Oku and Nili fire and water. In construing art as the act of conscious creation, very much like human gestation, in constru construing art as an act of conscious creation, very much like human gestation, development and birth, creativity and art become fundamentally intertwined as aspects of human fertility that fall under the divine principles of Ogugu. In the hidden language and mysteries of Afa, similar to Yoruba Ifa, Ogugu was an aspect or manifestation of Nechufu, the mother of God, who is also Neagu, Holy Mother Spirit, 
the supreme ruler of society, eternity, and everlastingness. John Anna Enechuku Ume explains that in addition to naming a divinity, the word Ogugu also references a well, hole, or pit. Such holes were and still are evocative of the womb, such that only females can be in initiates of the divinity Ogugu and are authorized to invoke her knowledge and wisdom. In some communities, women potters ritualize the process of production in order to preserve and protect the knowledge scheme that explains what pots really are. The knowledge scheme cloaks the relationship of clay to energy or life force. It reveals what the manipulation of clay actually achieves transcendentally. While the knowledge processes also disclose technical matters about pottery, production, production expert potters were reticent about the philosophical meaning behind pottery, as well as the constitutive energy of clay and the life force that earthenware vessels emit. Typically, most Expert potters do not go into an extended explanation of what they are doing if one does not grasp the ontological scheme within which they are operating. So there are usually two levels of interpretation or interrogation. One level limits everything to the descriptive sphere where descriptions are offered as to what the potter is striving to achieve. The next level, which is the more, um, the subterranean level, where the spiritual transcendental elements of what they are creating and what the artistic processes is about is oftentimes rarely disclosed. Can we go to the next slide? The female ethos of Ogugu. Okay. One of the, well, the knowledge processes also discloses technical matters about pottery production. Experts potters were are reticent about the philosophical meaning behind pottery, as well as the constitutive energy of clay and the life force that their earthenware vessels emit. Subsequently, clay quarries are sites of rituals dating back to early, earlier times, and quarrying clay is reminiscent of the phys physical processes of harvesting of the seed of life, while modeling clay represents the modeling of life and ultimately of giving birth. This social logic of paralleling life explains why women assumed supreme responsibility in controlling the quarrying of clay, Ulo. Though they may avail themselves of the help of male relatives, it is primarily the labor of adolescent males which they solicit. But in terms of identifying, locating, and controlling the quarrying of clay, that falls under the jurisdiction of women. The female ethos of Ogugu, notwithstanding, the divinity cares equally for all humans, male, female, and intersex. She extends creativity and creative essence to all. But it is in pottery production that the foundational basis for the development of design grammar for all art forms began. Women in different African communities exercised the dominant role in the establishment of the prevailing aesthetics. Their pioneering work in artistic designs and imaginative articulation of the decorative grammar of motifs in all regions influenced all other emerging art forms. Next slide.
Prior to European colonization, the artistic contributions were well known and respected. They were well respected, so much so that their pottery production was a very profitable and thriving business in diverse regions. It continues so for six decades after the injection of Euro modernity ideology. In different regions of Africa, women retained control of pottery production, even as far south as Southern Africa. Making pots was simultaneously an artistic, economic, and spiritual activity. Pottery's instrumental goals notwithstanding, the vessels and containers were produced with technical rigor, artistic excellence in mind. Under Aldinani, the instrumental goal of the pots, containers, and vessels did not invalidate nor undermine the aesthetic quality and character as it does under Euro modernity scheme. Beauty, ma. Is an essential component of life under ordinary. Producing Uma in vessels motivated talented potters to strive for excellence and to produce exceptional, exceptional works whose beauty, power, and energy were incontestable. Coloring slips of votive energy, vegetal dyes of aesthetic character were utilized in the beautification of pots and vessels. In the artistic processes of each umma, which is beautification, umma beauty established the regional character of the creations as well as marked visual patterns and textures and the distinguishing hand of the potter. In the process of each umma, the potters invented uli, ibu, and in cibidi, in the bibio. These were patterns that were either painted on or incised into the surface of vessels, creating a complex sculptural look. Expert potters continuously pushed the tradition, adapted old forms, invented new ones, adopted the stylistic shapes of other cultures, and thereby sketched the canons of traditions. The ubiquity and pivotal nature of earthenware pots in community life across centuries provides insights into the importance and centrality of women in societies. It also sheds light on the seemingly marginal role of women in the arts that had hitherto been portrayed in African art scholarship. We subsequently learn that the latter is due to Western overemphasis on sculpture and sculpted forms. Given the longevity and centrality of pottery in diverse African societies, we must refocus at research attention on how women created the design grammar of different artistic traditions from studying the vegetal and animal forms of nature. The decorative patterns and forms they invented were the same ones male sculptors and carvers transposed onto wood, iron, and bronze works. Next slide. Even in the masking tradition. Next slide, please, too. Even in the masking tradition, even the masking tradition did not escape women's influence. They remain the dominant inventors of forms as creators of fully and in CBD designs, which men liberally incorporated into their wood carvings, metal smithing leather working arts and masking practices, and as creators of the body art on which men modeled their abogom war masquerades. While Ogugu remains at the center of creativity and with women as the sole initiates of Ogugu, women were at the center of art. It is instructive that the Ogugu conception of art radically different from the Western one that did not underscore the importance of women and the holistic nature of life. Prior to European imperialism, pottery production in Africa was both spiritual 
artistic and utilitarian. The ordinary approach to creativity was profoundly metaphysical in conceptualizing pots as vessels that embodied life. They were receptacles produced by Oku fire light, allowing them to simultaneously extend Oku energy that pervades the universe and fuses, infuses life on earth. In a decolonial theorizing, it's necessary for rethinking dominant assumptions in art, African art studies and in repositioning African societies. Ordinary thinking is required to get us outside the boundaries of Western imperialism to uh, another new realm. The hand of the critically conscious potter, creating in spirit or in a more, is at best the divine hand of God. It is a hand infused with occult divine fire or energy that infuses occult dynamic energy into pots, bowls, or receptacles. This conscious extended extension of occult life force produces new objects and new meet, meanings in which ut utility and artistic simplicity fuse to become art. Tapping into the power of Ogugu places a potter creator in a meditative state, transforming him or her into extender of Oku, a producer such as the Tanzanian Lamisifueli Nyeikia produces energy charge forms that diviners like Tate Habibu seek for their healing work. An elevated sense of mission and artistic creation moves fabrication beyond the state of pure of mere craft. Celebrated potters in this vein are considered sighted artists who are powerfully linked to Oko life force. Their works are fresh and innovative by regional standards. They reflect the skill of the artist and are easily identifiable by community and regional buyers. Sightedness extends artistic tradition by reading art of stultifying rules, rules and conventions as creators heightened seeing, open the mind to unique combinations of forms, as well as to the uncommon relationships of styles and patterns. Conjoining these forms and patterns results in the effortless production of vessels with energy laden hands that capture elegance and simplicity in forms. The unique hand of a potter is the signature that marks her works from others. In conclusion, I'd like to reiterate that both the ideology, cosmology, and values of Euro modernity are at odds with how ordinarily construed arts, pots, and pottery making in African communities. For one, ordinarily valued the imaginative and artistic works of women potters. It centered them as pivotal forces of creativity. Their labor was neither gendered, commodified, nor owned by anyone. This valuation stems ensured that the creative, the, that the creators owned the products of their labor. Their unparalleled artistic activity and imaginative insight of the oldest art forms were accorded social status and the privilege they des deserved. So philosophically moving art outside the concept and category of gender, as well as outside Euro modernity, centers humanness, human values, and human creativity. It centers aesthetic agents of transformation. Through the first human art of pottery, Igbo women continued the tradition of being custodian of the ancient knowledge system of Owambo, the first world, ritualized in poetry, pottery making. The unparalleled legacy of that knowledge, of that knowledge systems, opens up energy pathways, epistemic connectedness of human existence to Ani. Reflecting on the processes of creative expression, Pottery making speaks to the myriad of ways artworks like human life are brought into existence in 
a blue tidal waves of the universe, a pulsating field of consciousness that is the life force. Art is not simply about aesthetic pleasure or art for art's sake. It is a powerful narrative about becoming and transformation. Art awakens us to the potentialities of our human powers and of the power of transformational change to bring possibilities into reality. As birthers of humanity, women have long been cognizant of this principle of adding to life that are actualized under different conditions. Thank you. I'm sure if, uh, if everybody was unmuted, you'd be hearing the applause, but uh, we are all clapping. Thank you very much um, for that talk. I wanna um, open it up first to uh, uh, any of the panelists, if they wanna ask a question or make a comment. And in the meantime, I welcome the audience to type in a question in the Q&A function. Hannah, go ahead. Thank you. First, I wanna say thank you so much for your presentation, Professor Nzeglu. Um, I noticed that you referenced a lot of archeological discoveries a lot in your speech relating to, for example, women's historical role in pottery. So I'm curious what you would say is the role of archeology span in your research? How has it interacted with your work in the past in case you would like to elaborate on, at all on that? Thank you. It didn't affect it in the past because in the academy, we tended to um, operate in, in silos, in the silos or department of archaeology, separate from the de department or silo of art history, separate from the silo of philosophy. But once the, um, the focus and emphasis is on interdisciplinarity, that is transcending the discipline, cutting across discipline, you begin to discover that some of what might be um, canonical in one discipline, turning to another discipline gives you uh, a deeper insight into areas that you never really thought about. Now in African studies, we don't necessarily go into archeology, span but for um, close to about, let's say seven years now, I've been, studying archaeology as a way of understanding the African continent, uh, the longevity, the various ways in which Africa had gone through various uh, climatic changes and climatic cycles. And if you're in archaeology, um, we also know about the Green Sahara and the pre previous era before. So what has become clear to those who are interested in African art is that archeology span is very pivotal and very essential. Some of the works that have been uncovered in Africa, uh, like the Ibuhu, uh, bronzes and uh, pottery, and in Ife, the bronze sculptures of Ife, most of that came about through archeology, uh, archeological uh, digs. So archeology span is not giving us a sense that some of our history that we may not be aware of, we need archeology span to begin to fill our vacuum with what is coming in from the archeological discoveries. So increasingly, and as I move to the future, I find that archeology span is very, very pertinent to aspects of Africa, Africa's history, particularly if we, consider the fact of Africa as the, the cradle of humanity. Uh, some areas have not even undergone any digs, but areas that are under, uh, have undergone digs are revealing uh, shards of history that even boggles our mind in terms of the longevity and the pristine nature in which some of them were preserved. So archaeology is important and is becoming very important in my work. Thank you. Do we have another uh, question from the panelists? IT, yes. Um, I had a question on sort of like the, uh, so when you were speaking about uh, like women as, as potters and their like vast knowledge of the earth and of like geological things, these all seemed like learned things. 
Um, and that, I don't know if that is an intent, intention with the idea of like intuitive, a, a woman's intuitive nature or relationship with nature. Um, so could you speak a little more to like the sort of spiritual aspect combining with the learned aspect and how does that sort of, I don't know if this, that, that's a clear, it's making sense, but um, it's okay, with, like, yeah. <laughs> okay, within the realm of art history, for anybody who is in art history, no, you, you come to the field as if everything has been done. Here it is, this is how it's done. This is the artistic, uh, stylistic traits in let's say Boronu sculpture or Boronu pottery. This is the uh, stylistic um, figurations of the Igbo sculpture or the Tanzanian. Well, what it doesn't really begin to grapple with is, how is it that in all these places, Women control pottery. Every single place you go on the continent, women are in charge of the pottery, contemporary today, and they give you the history, which is why I include the local histories. They always post, refer back to the host, uh, local history. It's been done for generations upon generations of time. So even in areas that we know that undertook migrations. For example, uh, Onitsha migrated from Benin uh, in the um, 14th, 15th century. You go to Benin and you push back the history of Benin. You find that area, th those areas, women were in, in charge of the pottery. You move to the Yoruba area and you keep pushing back. Women are at the center of uh, pottery contemporarily today and it goes back. So that aspect was what really got me uh, focused on if women were in control of this, nobody gave them the template at the very first moment. They had to figure it out. And to figure it out, you can get a wonderful clay, a clay soil, you can mold wonderful pots and leave them to dry. Okay, you've, you've, you've got um, um, a product. You've got a shape, you've got a form. Put water in it. The whole thing goes back to earth. So there has to be something that actually prodded them that you needed fire to be able to stabilize this and make it impermeable. But the fire has to burn at a particular temperature to be able to achieve it. So all of these are scientific processes, which it never really dawned on me when I started work in this area, that because we come to everything full blown, we never really ask the originators of this. And if women are the center of this, gee, we really need to give women the credit. We need to see that they are scientists as well. They are geologists as well. If they are able to figure these things out, identify where all this location for the soil and the processes, the scientific processes needed to transform clay to this. But in the cosmological scheme, in the epistemological scheme they operated, that the physical and the spiritual, spiritual are not intention. They are interwoven. And in that interwovenness, that also allows you to explore other means of communication. So where people may say, I saw it in a dream, that is the language they give you. So a scientist may say, well, they were solving, a, thinking about a problem and they finally uh, were able to come together to solve this problem in a dream. So if they're referencing a dream, that would be one way of explaining it. A spiritual way of explaining it might also be, well, there could be the forces that surround them, leads them to see, um, to get access and to solve these problems or takes them to a location where they learn the processes and how to solve their problems. From where I stand, there is no contradiction. 
the ways and means of knowledge evolving and knowledge being produced intertwines with both the cognitive at the cognitive level with both the physical processes of knowing as well as the non um, physical processes of knowing or the spiritual it's the essence that you bring to the work the language may be spiritual in the in the ways that you you articulate it but what it does is to speak to other non physical modes and means of knowledge acquisition and in so far as i am interested in the knowledge acquisition bit whether you learn it physically or spiritually my role is to understand how knowledge is working in this vein so for me the two are not intention in most of them the two are one and when people speak when ordinary people speak, they may speak, they saw it in a sense in a vision mode or in a dream mode or in a meditative mode. So they are, the language that they use in describing what they are seeing should not be the focus. What is the focus is what the knowledge is pointing us to and in how that which is non-physical integrates with the physical to give us the potteries and the forms that they produce. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have another panelist question? Should we go to an audience question? Okay, let me know if you have a question. We can come back to the panelists. Uh, we have a question from Usman Traore, I'm hoping uh, I'm pronouncing that somewhat correctly. Um, here's the question. Was there a specific male socio-professional activity uh, symbolizing the gender balance in Igbo society in complementarity of female control and mastering of clay? Carving. There was carving particularly carving of Iroko um, for, let's say, the, the, uh, the big drums, which is called uh, ekwe. Um, but to, to be able to carve those big drums, you had to have iron smithing. So iron smithing had to have developed, iron ore and iron smithing. So in various areas of the Igbo region, yes, there were uh, iron smithing and blacksmiths. So that produced, so that produced it, and that produced the complementarity. In the creation, in the um, the the works, in the creation of the the a lot of the artistic pro, uh, products that are wood, particularly um, hard wood carvings from very very hard woods like the Iroko or the uh, ebony. These are tr very tropical hardwoods. The decorations that are found in a lot of those uh, works are from Uli. Uli is the women's art of um, symbolic forms and decorations. So what happens is that the, the production and the decorative motifs are produced by the women as Uli or in Sibidi. And then those ones uh, in that mode of complementarity are deployed in enhancing or embellishing um, the wood objects that are created, which may be wooden doors, uh, wooden posts, wooden pillars that prop up uh, the homesteads, uh, drums uh, and all. Thank you, I wonder if I could um, follow up with a somewhat related question. We read in our group one of your other uh, essays in which you described some uh, statue work in the Igbo society. And um, there you discuss various dynamics between the sort of bodily decoration that would take place for certain ceremonies uh, among the women 
and then the sort of relation between that and some of the wooden uh, or other kinds of carvings. And something really, uh, something really uh, struck me about, about your dis discussion of that, which was the injection of uh, moral categories or virtue categories in the aesthetic conception of beauty when it came to these statues. And I was wondering uh, throughout some of your talk today, whether this is a general sort of, is there a general uh, kind of moral aspect to aesthetic properties in this way of thinking of things? And if so, uh, does that relate in any interesting way to the aesthetic quality of some of these incredible pots that we just saw, <laughs> that we just saw pictures of in your presentation? The, the, ways in, the, the ways in which the ethical and the aesthetics come together, which is basically what you're asking about, right? The ways in which they come, they come together uh, goes back to the um, conceptual scheme within which they operate, uh, which is what I'm articulating. That is the ordinary uh, framework. And the ordinary framework is structured ethically. It's an ethical reference uh, scheme. Um, and it's, it's also, it's, it's very much ethical and it's, because it provides the, what one can call the, the first principles of life, the principles that regulate uh, humanity, human life and, and order, because we go, uh, always go back to it, it's always at the background informing and infusing whatever is being done. Uh, creation, you can also create for, um, I don't want to use the word evil, but malevolent intent. You can create a work for malevolent intent and you can create a work for, for well-being and for um, regeneration, the regenerative component of, of, uh, of life and of people. That is the sphere where I have, um, been discussing most of the time. So in which case, the ethical element is already presupposed. Now, it's at the point where one is making a distinction, am I going to be creating this for uh, malevolent purposes, which sometimes is done, either for revenge or for all kinds of things, which requires you to fabricate certain kinds of things to, but even as you're fabricating certain kinds of things, the consciousness and the intent that is being done for malevolence is always there because you are going to send it out on a mission, on a no good do mission. So even at that level, the ethical scheme is already there guiding uh, what you are doing or overseeing what you are doing. And the person is conscious of how they are deviating from the norms. But at the same time, and for most uh, artistic work, they uh, the produce the creators work on the other side of uh, producing things that will be of use to humanity, of use to members of the community, whether uh, create pleasure, amplify pleasure, uh, support the, um, the architecture of the place in ways that will make the architecture uh, visually pleasing in the, se in the sense that most most homes, historically, not contemporary, I'm not talking contemporary now, historically, most homes are embellished uh, with uh, murals. They are embellished with murals and then the floors are polished with a slip of clay slip every morning to create that uh, aesthetic uh, sense sensibility that is welcoming um, of people and that reinforces them and reinforces their own being uh, as, as, um, as humans. That in that space of art as uh, aesthetics, you find that subtle interweaving already there, but behind that is the consciousness of what it's being done for. 
and what is being done for already sets it in place. So regardless of whether you are moving to the good side or the malevolent side, you are working within a context where the ethical principles are already predefined and everything you do, you are going to be judged by it, which is where the concept of Ezioku Bundu, truth is life. If you persist in doing something that is malevolent and indulging in falsehood, then death is the repercussion for that. So that is very, very uh, well-defined and integrated in the ways in which Igbos historically conducted their lives. Always conscious of their uh, moral integrity, uh, moral uh, choices, what they are doing as humans, because they will tell you what you do, you have to answer for it. And what you do doesn't necessarily come back to you as an individual, because you are part of a family and a part of a lineage and part of a community. So you, the individual, needs to take responsibility for your actions in the ways it's going to affect the community because you can be the destruction, this destructive seed and what you have done will still affect them. So with that type of uh, kind of very clearly defined moral framework, whatever they do as uh, artists and as potters and as carvers and as ironsmiths, there's a consciousness of the ethical scheme of the ethical implications of whatever they're doing. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for this um, fascinating and, and, and important talk too. We were just about out of time. Um, thank you for uh, the, the, uh, to the audience and the panelists too for your questions. Um, we hope uh, you all can join us next time and please um, help me somehow without your mics on uh, <laughs> applauding our speaker and, and, and thank you for, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the IT team for that. Thank you. Okay. We'll see Wonderful. you all next time. Thank you for everything. <laughs>